I'm arguing that I think buildings can be tremendously dramatic. I think buildings can be uh, unique in their character, but the manner in which they generate that character, the manner in which they talk, needs to be appropriate to the place. Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. Today we are speaking with William Pedersen of KPF Architects. Um, William wrote a book that's extremely thick uh, and that's because he's done an intense and amazing amount of work uh, across the world. He's worked with IM Pay and started his own firm that has been world renowned. When you look through this book and see the different uh, projects that are just world famous, it's a little uh, intimidating because he's accomplished so much. So I'm going to try and not be intimidated in this interview and just try and talk to a human, uh, but get something out of this as uh, some kind of investigation on to what caused the success. Um, the work they've done is astounding, and I'm really lucky to be able to uh, pick William or Bill Pedersen's brain. So please welcome William Pedersen. Bill Pedersen, thank you so much for joining us on architecture, architecture design, and photography. Um, really excited to be able to talk to you because, first of all, uh, you've written and just recently published this very large, very heavy, and very uh, photo-heavy book. So it was really enjoyable to to look through this, uh, to read about the different buildings, to read to read your introduction, which gave me all my questions that I want to dive into with you. Um, but the 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 breadth the the amount of work that you've accomplished and the um, the effect on the population of the world uh, is is an extremely rare thing to find encapsulated in an individual. Um, you know, it's it's on the level of uh, you know author you know well received authors, rock stars, poets, whatever uh, to be able to talk to someone about this kind of influence is, is a real treat and, uh, and an opportunity to try and learn more about yourself personally so people can uh, kind of absorb what you've done throughout your life that you believe has been both uh, contributing to success and to failure. Because as you spoke about in, in your introduction there that I read, that um, some of your failures are, have been you know, extremely valuable uh, things to learn from that have that have given you in in turn your success which which I've found in my own life the failures if I can face them have been uh again the the most valuable thing I have so I'll try and not talk so much and just drop some questions and and uh see what we get but I'd like to start out uh a little bit more on a on a personal note and then lead into uh more of your professional life if that's all right sounds good so first of all, I noticed you had uh, you had dedicated this to the memory of your wife and your two daughters. And my question would be, first of all, why do uh, authors uh, dedicate a book? And second of all, um, why did you then dedicate it to your uh, the memory of your wife and your daughters? Well, my wife played uh, an extraordinarily um, consistent and dedicated role in my whole career. I, I met my wife uh, at the very beginning of my architectural studies. And oh. so she was, with, she was with me from 1958 until her death in 19, uh, 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, as a result, uh, well, uh, her... her specific interest did not necessarily lie in uh, accelerating my career or encouraging me to advance in my work. It was the sort of the calmness and the dignity and the serenity of the environment that was uh, brought about by her that made so much of this possible. Hmm. And of course, my children as well, uh, who uh, were a product of our our relationship and uh, their uh, 
uh, long endurance as I went through probably the more difficult uh, years of my career, uh, when the intensity of it was at a fevered pitch, <laughs> they were uh, in their earliest years. So. It, it's always interesting to me to uh, ask that question of people who have been uh, highly successful and have a very easy time getting to the core of the answer that you just gave, that, that, the, that value of that uh, foundational relationship that uh, allows you to do what you do, interestingly comes and is understood very easily by everyone I've, that I've asked that question of uh, that, that has been successful. So there's, there's, in the back of my mind, I, I hold this idea like, well, if someone's wealthy or successful, they must have taken something from someone else or been highly aggressive and very difficult to work with. But time and time again, when I interact with people who have accomplished a lot, they're consistently extremely humble and uh, pass their, um, their accomplishments basically on to those who they have worked with uh, consistently. Well, I, let me just add a little bit to, to my wife's role in all of this, because um, she was an extraordinarily magnetic person. Mm. Uh, magnetic in the sense that she had an ability to listen to a person in a way where they felt they were 100% in her, um, in her, in her sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, while she was not a professional person, she worked uh, in, a, in a great many nonprofit enterprises during our, our career together. Uh, at the end of her life, she became the president of the Shelter Island Historical Society. And her magnetism and her warmth and her sincerity sort of galvanized that institution. And as a result of it, um, and not at her direct assistant, insistence, but uh, I uh, suggested the possibility that they go about creating a major expansion to the institution, hmm. um, which they, they did. I designed, uh, Elizabeth and I financed it. It's been built. And she died just as it opened. Um, it has been a transformative um, institution. Uh, the, the degree to which it, it has rallied the community of Shelter Island is extraordinary. And the degree to which people remember and love her is of a level that uh, one would only have to experience to be able to fully appreciate. She had the interpersonal skills that were enabled people to work together in such a positive way. And uh, I seeing this at the end of her life uh, was for me uh, a great reward because I was the one that was out there working. <laughs> she, uh, but she herself had a much more innate ability to, to make connections than I do. Hmm. Interesting. I, I find a, a, um, a lot of commonality in my own marital experience there that I'm, I am not the, um, I'm not the one that a lot of people want to hug a lot of the times, but my wife is. <laughs> She's far more, far more personable, uh, animated, entertaining, and and probably a lot more uh, thoughtful and giving than myself. And I, I have a lot to learn from that. And it, it's, it, it, um, it, it's interesting. I was thinking the other day that that uh, accomplishment and power. Uh, are uh, very quickly lost if the accomplishment and power is gained at your own will or ability to hold something of power. Like, as, as an analogy, you're only as powerful as long as you're holding the gun. But if your power comes from the community that enables you, it's, it's not something that uh, 
it can be taken from you as soon as your back is turned because you have so many people behind you that that uh, have given you the ability to do what it is you do that it's it's not you singularly there accomplishing you realize that what you're doing comes from everybody that that put you where you're at and that's a it's a interesting thing in the di- power dynamics of chimps that if a chimp comes to power through force as soon as his back is turned the other chimps take him out but if that chimp comes to power through the community that kind of empowers that chimp that that power is much more uh has a has a longer lasting effect throughout the community rather than something that's taken as soon as your back is turned so not well that's an int- really an interesting uh, statement and sort of summarizes in many respects um my life as well uh i'm not the person that one wants to hug <laughs> uh, elizabeth was the person one wanted to hug and in my professional relationship with my partner jean cohn Jean is a person one wants to hug. And we have worked as a remarkable team because I totally understand that. And uh, uh, for example, after a presentation, everybody will go up to Jean and say, that's what's wonderful, it was fantastic. <laughs> Rarely do they come up to me and say it was wonderful and fantastic. <laughs> and I, I've grown to accept it. But you know, the nature of a, a, a really a, an effective relationship, I think has to, provide for that sort of dynamic. Yeah. And uh, it, for, for us, I, I've been very fortunate uh, in uh, maintaining those relationships. I mean, our, my relationship with Elizabeth was 60 years, over 60 years. Oh, wow. My relationship with Jean Cohn has been over 50 years. So it uh, is, is something that, uh, uh, it is a characteristic of my personality that I do hang around. <laughs> so, uh, uh, do you find yourself to be uh, more introverted and introspective more than extroverted? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And I particularly am aware of it now um, as I've been living alone for two years. My wife died two years ago. Uh, again, I found myself in a relationship with an outgoing person yeah. uh, because I need it. If I don't have it, I can't. I can't really generate it myself. I'm just not the one to initiate the phone calls or initiate. Uh, I, I need to have someone that uh, is is teamed with me uh, in, in a way where it, we both gain something out of it. Right, right. And I I have had a business partnership dynamic in my past that 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 uh, did not go well. I I think to a large degree, because we had too much of the similar personality types. It would have been like two bills or two trends working together. And it was just, there wasn't enough of a complementary nature of the relationship that made it succeed. Yeah, I, I, I uh, very, was aware of this very early in the game. And, and it was one of the reasons, of course, that I entered into the relationship. We had three founding partners, Gene Cohn, Shelley Fox, and myself. And I've always uh, made the analogy of, of, of the three of us together uh, to the parts of a sailboat, uh, mm. where uh, Gene, uh, well, let's call Gene the sails, I would be the hull, and Shelley would definitely be the keel. He was the one that stabilized us. Right. And without the, that relationship of the, of the three of us, each of us essentially doing separate things, not, I did not, do, make any effort to try to do what Gene does. Gene did not make an effort to do what I do, and neither of us made an effort to do what Shelley did. Could could you clarify like the three technical aspects of your business that you each handled? Well, yeah, I mean, Gene was definitely the driving force of the entrepreneurial aspect of it. Uh, He uh, he is a natural, I, I very, I'm very reluctant to use the word salesman because Gene just genuinely likes people. And as a result, you know, he's out there spreading the word. He believes in us. Uh, he supports us. In many respects, his most valuable role with our office is within the office itself, where people will come to Gene with their problems, one issue or another issue, and they will always know that they will get a sympathetic ear. 
Uh, well, some people come to me, not as often, and very rarely to Shelley. It was Gene who played that role. So in many respects, he was more valuable inside the office than outside the office. But uh, outside the office, he was incredibly valuable. Hmm. And how about your, yourself and Shelley, is it? Well, I, I have, a, a, I think, a rather, um, I don't know if I would call it unique, but I have an ability to explain what I try to do. Mm. Uh, I can articulate to a client what I'm trying to do in a way that they can understand, that, mainly because I understand it. Right, uh, right. I don't work arbitrarily. I work through a process uh, that is easily explainable. And my intention is to try to be able to bring the client into the relationship with me so that when I make a new business presentation with Gene, I mean, Gene may have generated the, the client and, the, and uh, introduces the, but when I t start talking about design, uh, I'm the salesman too. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, without that, uh, it, it wouldn't be complete. Right. And, and how about Shelley? Well, Shelley, um, Shelley uh, played a role as a stabilizer in the office. He wasn't very much part of the dynamic of our external presentations, uh, but he did play a role of balancing all of our financial interests, of dealing with all of our staffing interests and things of that nature. So uh, again, as I say, a, a stabilizer for the organization. Okay. And what was the size of your office or is the size of your office? <laughs> well, now it's, it's 750 people. Wow. In, in nine offices throughout the world. Uh, New York has a lion's share of probably between 350 and 400. But it's, it's a very large organization. And it's frankly a product of the nature of our structure. Uh, we were determined to we were determined to be able to provide an environment where individuals could find their, the fulfillment of their professional aspirations if they, if they decided they wanted to and if they had the talent to do it. Mm. And that meant that I didn't hang on to a, a guy who worked with me as a young designer and I didn't hang on to him until the end of his days, which happens in many organizations. But as soon as he was ready or she was ready, and trained and ready to go out and take on things that, by herself or himself, uh, they were encouraged to do it. And all of this was particularly um, necessary uh, in the age of globalism. Mm. When we left our shores and started to go to Japan and to China, Korea and whatever, you know, we just couldn't, Gene and I just couldn't cover all the bases. And so it was necessary to have younger people who could represent us in a way that uh, would make us credible uh, to, to that community. And that's what's built our organization. I mean, now we're led by those people and right. Gene and I are pretty much out of the picture. You know? uh, well, it, it's interesting to hear the explanation of how Gene, yourself and Shelley uh, ran things. And I, I can identify with you in a way of, of uh, being very introspective and introverted the, the things that you do, you, you mull and you, you struggle with and you, you emotionally deal with, and, but then you translate it into an articulate form that you can explain why you've come to those conclusions. And I can highly identify that with that, and I highly identify with the um, inability to be that, uh, that extroverted person that really has to break the ice with a client or you know, in a social setting to make everyone feel comfortable and then be able to explain the intricacies of a design and then to have that third person keeping it all on an even keel. That's uh, that is a really uh, a really nice balance you had going on there. <laughs> Apparently it's worked well for you. A lot of this came about uh, as a result of prior experiences. Okay. Um, I, I had spent uh, four years working with I.M. Pei's office. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Rome, uh, I am, was on my Rome Prize jury, and, and I won the Rome Prize, and he suggested I come back and work for him. 
Now, could you explain a little of the backstory on why what you were doing to be in the position to get this Rome uh, prize and why he was there? And because that that kind of drops out of the sky of like, oh my goodness, how are you in a foreign country? Yeah, competing I should in? I should really go back to the University of Minnesota. Okay, I, I should I, I should re- I should go back even further than that. Um, uh, <laughs> I went uh, my um, my grandfather started a, a, a plan service in the United States. It was the first plan service in the United States. It was called originally Pedersen's Practical Homes. Oh, but I love it. ended it. up being, being Practical Homes. And, and it, was, it started in the 20s. My father worked with him. And uh, he had come, he was a Norwegian immigrant. He'd come over, been a land surveyor, then started building houses and then started doing some very nice things and, and built an extraordinary house for himself, beautifully detailed, very Wrightian as a matter of fact, almost uh, uh, influenced heavily by the Winslow house of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm. At any rate, that was in my background. My father was involved in construction. We always talked about buildings and whatever at home. And then I was sent off to a little uh, boys school, St. Paul Academy. We had 18 in our class and uh, no girls. It was just a, a boys school. And I went there for 12 years. And uh, during that period, um, I developed an intense interest in the playing of hockey. Uh, I was interested in everything. I, I, I was the captain of the football team. I was the captain of the baseball team. I was the captain of the hockey team. I, I was an athlete. More than anything, and certainly more than a student, I was, I was an athlete. And coming from this little school, I was very determined to play hockey for the University of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota was for us at that time in the 50s, the, the place, the only place to play hockey. No one else counted, you know? And so I, I went there, I totally unrecruited. Nobody really knew that much about me. I went to this played in this little private school league. And I ended up making the freshman team and was considered uh, a, a very good prospect. Well, at the same time, I had met, uh, I, I had enrolled at the Institute of Technology, in the Institute of Technology. And almost by default, I wrote down architecture as my base, as my major, you know? And the first year, one didn't one dealt with the basic courses in physics and uh, geometry and whatever. And I did extremely well on the hockey team. I, I, I was one of the stars of the freshman team, as a matter of fact. And they wanted how, to transfer. How about the physics? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'd gone to a good. I, frankly, I'd gone to a good high school, and so I was able to get by on the physics, but <laughs> okay. uh, without too much effort. And, and, so um, they considered me the, that I, they wanted to transfer me from center ice to a defenseman. And so I was practicing twice a day, both with the freshman and the varsity. Uh, so the next year in the fall, I met my wife Elizabeth on the steps of the Kaisai fraternity house. I started playing hockey and we and started going to the School of Architecture in, in, in grade one. Had all these three things. For the first three games, I played magnificently and I had some really good press out of it. And then our first architectural problem was due. And I stayed up three or four nights just to finish the damn thing. And I really had no idea what I was doing. I finished it. We played a game against North Dakota. And halfway through the game, Johnny Mariucci, who was our coach, said, Peterson, he'd always mispronounce my name when he was angry with me. He said, Peterson, take a rest. <laughs> well, we were a damn good team. I mean, the, my, my teammate, Herbie Brooks, became the coach of the Miracle on Ice in 1980. Oh, wow. Uh, so, so he was a big, and Johnny Mariucci was an all Hall of Famer played for the Chicago Blackhawks, and, and we were playing hockey at a level where, for example, Colorado College s- sent their best player to the National Hockey League and became Rookie of the Year. So it was a big deal. Our goalie was a goalie on the 1960 Olympic team that won in Squaw Valley. So I got to a point where I realized that I could not do both of these things. 
And for the first year, I sort of managed to get myself through it. I went on all the road trips and whatever. Uh, but the second year, I decided to quit. D decided to quit hockey. I decided to quit hockey and now, focus on archi architecture. What was the process of understanding, like as a as a boy or young man of that age, obviously hockey is more exciting. That's. It, it, it still is to me, frankly. <laughs> I, I don't really mean that, but, but there were a number of things that assisted me along the way. Uh, I went down to Rochester, Minnesota to meet Elizabeth's parents for the first time. Elizabeth's father was the head of physiology at the Mayo Clinic, and I had come down, I'd, I'd gotten a bad scar over my left eye, and we were sitting at the family dinner table, and, and um, Elizabeth's mother was looking nervously at her watch. You know, I had taken the bus down from Minneapolis. And she looked at it and she said, isn't it about time for you to go, to go back to rehearsal? She called hockey practice rehearsal. <laughs> Put your tutu on and go do your ice dancing kind of thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so anyway, I got a, it was quite a clear message that if I wanted to make it into that family, I wasn't going to do it as a hockey player. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was one of the messages. Eventually, I, I went from grade one to grade two, started, started gradually to get a feeling for it, although it certainly didn't come immediately. And then in my grade three, uh, I had a professor by the name of Leonard Parker. And Leonard Parker had spent five years with Aero Saarinen. He was one of Aero Saarinen's uh, right-hand men. And he had come to Minnesota. And at the end of grade three, he asked me to work for him. Hmm. And I did for the summer. And that summer totally transformed me. Uh, he had all the documents of the Sarnan office, the Sarnan Auditorium building, the MIT chapel. We had the renderings of Cranbrook, which I became very enthusiastic about. I learned to render like Eliel Sarnan. Uh, to make a story short, I went back to my fourth year, my last year at Minnesota, totally a transformed designer, hmm. and did probably some of the best things then that maybe I've done, done in my lifetime, frankly. Now, what what was transformative for you? Was it the the work that was produced or the individuals producing it? Well, what was transformative was, that, first of all, the, the, the depth to which he uh, examined a project. Uh -huh. uh, he had come out of the Sarnan tradition, and buildings were built extremely well, well detailed, and that aspect of it, plus just simply learning all of the basic rudiments of, of, of architecture, or starting to learn the rudiments of architecture, uh, was uh, for, for me an experience that I was unprepared for because I didn't recognize, I just simply didn't recognize the complexity of the crowd. Mm. Also, I didn't recognize the dedication that was necessary. I mean, Parker worked 80 hours a week, and he was there all the time, and he was running the office by himself. I was his only employee. As wow. a matter of fact, there's a, a, a very interesting story. Uh, his first major commission was the Jewish Community Center in, in, in St. Paul. And 20 years after it was built, he was awarded the gold medal at the and the head of the Jewish Community Center spoke. And he said, when we interviewed Leonard Parker, he had little or no staff. Well, I was able to announce that I was a no staff that Leonard Parker had <laughs> at that particular point in time. But Leonard Parker, if I have mentors, Leonard Parker would be my fundamental mentor. Mm -hmm. He was the one that got me in the direction that uh, made me realize, made me want to realize how, what was necessary uh, to become an architect. Hmm. And then I'll go on to my experiences later, which because what I produced at Minnesota was what won the Rome Prize for me. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that, and that uh, enabled me then to, to come in contact with the IMP office. And when I worked at IMP's office, I, I was working with IM all the time. He was the only person I worked with in the office. And I was, wow. I was after a year or so, put on the design of the National Gallery in Washington. 
And so I was essentially the, the senior designer of the National Gallery. I was 29 years old. So. Wow. Huh. So it, uh, now, what was, I, I mean, that must have been an astounding transformation over, I would imagine, essentially under four years to go from falling in love with architecture to working with I.M. Pei. It was four years, yes. The, I mean, how, uh, how does that settle in on an individual? I, that had to be um, kind of set your head spinning. Well, <laughs> well was, was he as big of a deal then as we see him now? Oh, yeah, he was. He was only 48 at the time when I first joined him. Yeah. Uh, and he had a personality that when you were in his presence, you were the only one that counted. Huh. And uh, back in those days, uh, I had come back from Italy. I was dressed elegantly in three-piece suits, which were made in Italy, and <laughs> I felt up to the job. And, and frankly, because of my naivete, you know, I felt more confident then than I do now. And <laughs> I, I, I felt totally, totally up to anything. And uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful discussion. <laughs> I, I potentially was going to go back to Boston to work for my mentor and, and, and teacher at MIT, uh, but he, he convinced me to go to, to New York. Hmm. And uh, it, it was, for me, uh, the, the most necessary step that uh, I, I needed to make in my career. Sometimes the, it seems the ignorance of youth is, our, is one of our biggest assets to success. Because it, <laughs> it, it catapults all these individuals towards trying to, you know, fly over a wall and uh, an endless amount of them hit the wall. But it's, it's the ignorance of youth that a couple get over it. Um, but that kind of leads me into my next question. You know, eliminating all the other co contributing factors of family, friends, culture, right place, right time. What is it about you personally that you believe contributed to your success? Well, um, I like to believe that, or I do believe that I, <laughs> um, I, I'm very confident about what I, what I create. Mm -hmm. I, I think I create it as a result of, of responding to the necessary forces that are generating the, the, the problem. And once I found, once I found uh, the manner in which one can, uh, coordinate all of these forces uh, into a sort of a coherent response, um, it seems inevitable. And it, it, it seems right. And mm. uh, that's, uh, I feel like I'm right. Maybe wrong, but I, I feel like I'm right. <laughs> and so it, uh, I, I, confidence, um, you know, I, maybe, my, my uh, career in sports helped a little bit with that. I, yeah. I was intensely competitive, but I, sometimes I think that's just that's over, overblown. Um, it, it just it, it was just an intuitive feeling that I was on the right track. Hmm. But uh, again, I would I would push well not push back, but I would guide us back to the previous part of this conversation that someone who is introverted is going to be highly introspective and in constantly re-examining their own thought process and the reasons for which they've come to the answers that they hold and constantly readjusting those answers as they move forward. And I'd imagine that that uh, that personality trait for for specifically what you've uh, what what part you have played in the success of uh, KP, KPF, so I'm so bad with names, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the specific role that you uh, played in that, has, I, I would imagine, like you're saying, has a high degree of, of that introspection of your thought and creative process, I would think. Yeah, uh, introspection um, is one thing, but introversion is another. 
Mm. Uh, I'm not introverted when it comes to talking about my architecture. I'm right. not introverted when it comes to discussing the issues that are involved with a particular problem. Right. I may be introverted uh, uh, when it comes to taking up the phone and, and, and calling somebody for a job or something of that nature. <laughs> but uh, when, when it comes to dealing with the nature of a problem, uh, I, I feel a very, feel very differently. So. Mm. so how how does it feel to you when you when you settle in to look at a problem? Have you have you uh, thought about your own creative process much and how that actually works and what it is? Yeah, I, I have. When I was at, at the University of Minnesota, um, we were taught that you should look for the big idea, mm. which is fine. <laughs> And one could spend an awful lot of time looking for the big idea. In other words, uh, essentially dreaming through the process. Um, later in life, I recognize that the only way to search for the idea is to go through many, many possibilities. And I, 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 in my introduction to my book, I talked about the the experience I had with the uh, City College of New York, where I was given an assignment of a, an enormous building. Mm -hmm. And I, I produced a single design. I had, uh, had waited for the big idea. I had the big idea, and I presented it. <laughs> well, uh, it was not well received. Uh, and I was speaking to a large audience, which included the dean of the School of Architecture and, uh, you know, serious people. And in the rejection of that idea, I realized that I needed to find another way of working hmm. that had to be a, one where I was able to communicate more directly with people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, as I said in my book, I called, I developed something I called the comparative process. And the comparative process was not designed to be able to give one a Chinese menu so a client could just select one here and one here and one here and combine them together. The comparative process was designed to present a series of possibilities for each of the problems, each of the design situations we face that enabled people to, particularly our clients, but also ourselves, to get more deeply into the problem. By forcing yourself to look at it from many angles, not just a single angle, which one may become enamored of initially, mm. but looking at it from many angles and then to show this to a client and allow them to start to understand what they, in fact, hold as their aspiration for the building. Because you, it's unfair to ask a client, what do you want? Because nobody can nobody can make that response. They can only know when they see something that they respond to. Mm. And so working through this comparative process was a huge breakthrough. And I used I used it from that day, which was back in 19, probably 1971, uh, to, to, to this day. And our, everybody in our office uses it as well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a means that enables you to, it forces you to look at a problem from multiple angles. And uh, it, uh, it's also fun. So, so a, a question that comes out of that in, in, in my head, uh, I believe you had said in your book that the, um, the process that you presented at that initial one, that, that had, uh, at that presentation for uh, the College of uh, City College of New York is that it? That's right. Uh -huh. um, you had come through that to that process through working with I.M. Pei, who would present in that way. Is that right? I am. I, I am only presented a single solution. Right, and, and, and he he may he may in his own mind have gone through many many alternatives, but uh, for example, when the National Gallery was presented to me. It was, a, it was presented to me in, in, the, in the form of a single diagram, which did not delineate all the elements of the building, but just the basic gesture of that building. 
Mm -hmm. And we did not deviate substantially from that diagram from the very first day. Mm -hmm. And it, it maintained, with a lot of effort, it maintained its integrity throughout the entire process. Now, why, why do you think that approach worked for IM Pay's office, but for your office that's been extremely successful, this different approach works better? It's, it's a, a really a one, the nature of the uh, assignment, perhaps. Uh, when IM was working on the National Gallery, uh, he, he was brought there because of, of his superior qualities and there was a trust that was, was initially built into it. Okay. Uh, when I was presenting to the City College of New York, uh, <laughs> I had no reputation. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, so that was a, a, an immediate assistance. But more relevant probably is, why do I still have to use that process uh, after so many years and, and having established a reputation and my answer is that it's the only way that I can get to understand myself and to get to understand my client hmm. and to get to understand the site. And I enjoy the, working through a, a series of possibilities because I just learn more about myself and about the client as a result of it. Hmm. Yeah, to me that it that again kind of comes back to what we were saying about how different uh, chimps can hold power, where someone like IM Pei, uh, the, the reputation of that single individual precedes uh, them, and the ideas are singularly attached to him, and on the receiving end, it would seem like the client has less of, a, of an ability to critique something coming from this single individual with this reputation. But then at the same time, the adverse effect of that is that the business created around that single individual will then possibly very much so decline after that single individual is no longer pushing it. So it's putting all the eggs in a basket it, to a degree, it seems. I don't know. Well, uh, yes, and, and, and uh, I, in no way would I ever uh, challenge the, the workings of an I.M. Pei or a, a Louis Kahn. Uh, but let's uh, be realistic about it. Uh, a very, very small percentage of people fall into that category. Yeah. Uh, I certainly don't. And, and I don't consider anybody that is working within our organization to fall into the category either. Um, of, of the percentage of architects, you, you could name maybe five architects yeah. uh, worldwide that, that, that could and should fall into that category. But the rest of us really have to understand the problem from another dimension. Huh. And uh, it, it's, it's that process which, frankly, has enabled us to bring the participants of our team into the design process in a more immediate way because they're involved with all of the various solutions themselves. Mm. And so uh, architecture, and certainly in IM's office, architecture was a very collaborative process. I mean, IM relied heavily on his team. And what was so exciting to me about working with IM is when IM saw something that he thought was good, he would get excited about it. And as a result, you know, the author of it would get excited about it, about it too. And we felt really good about working in that way, you know. And it was not something that had to come from his pen. He set the original direction, but he did not in any way force it himself to go in only one direction. Hmm. Um, I believe an architect like Khan may have thought very differently about that. And of course, he, he was a genius, so he, did, he forced it in the right direction. But when you, when you work on a different scale, the work on the scale that we do, uh, you have many people that you have to, uh, you have to gain the sympathy of many people and the understanding of many people, and they have to know what you're trying to do, and they have to support what you're trying to do. And they will only support what you're trying to do if they feel that they've been listened to, and if they feel that, in fact, they have a hand in contributing it. 
uh, mm -hmm. uh, to it. And that has, and it, that has been the, the fundamental uh, philosophy that, that's enabled our firm to succeed. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really beautiful explanation of that. I, um, one of my follow-up questions here, uh, I think you just, just crossed off the list. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the other reasons I'm, I'm really uh, excited to be able to pick your brain is that this idea of designing these super tall buildings the, these you know uh, skyscrapers, they they are such a standalone, um, you know, anthropomorphized in many ways version of a building that just dominate the built environment like nothing before us in history almost, you know, come the pyramids basically, um, and to to understand like how do you approach okay, we're going to design something that's going to be hundreds of feet tall and be that visible. It, it, and it, 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 it just cries um, of the human form in many ways, a, a, a vertical representation of a, of a thing that just, what, what is the approach when you, when you because, because they're, they're highly repetitious because it's just floor after floor and you can repeat the thing the whole way up. But what is the approach of sculpting and shaping and dividing it into different layers and relating it to the surrounding uh, environment? What, how on earth do you take the first kind of uh, informed sketches on trace paper when designing something at that scale? Well, this is going to take a little while. Uh, it, <laughs> it's a podcast. They're mowing the lawn or jogging. That's okay. <laughs> um, you know, when I first joined Gene, um, the first buildings we did were with were, were ABC television. Because oh, wow. Shelley Fox, my partner, had, had, a, had a relative that was leading construction at the, that institution. And, and so as a result, uh, our first buildings were relatively low. But we, we did get a, uh, a design build project with Hubert Hunt Nichols uh, down in Lexington, Kentucky. And at that point, um, I really didn't have a process for designing the tall building. And the product, uh, frankly, demonstrates that you won't, it's not too easy to find in our, in our, <laughs> you know, in our uh, backlog of work. But what became evident to me at, at that time was that we were probably going to be, because we were just coming out of the, the deep recession of the 70s and into the early 80s, and we were probably going to find ourselves with the, the high-rise commercial office building as being our number one architectural topic. Now, the degree to which the high-rise commercial office building was regarded in the artistic community mm. uh, was, was uh, very much in question. Uh, architects of, of, of the serious nature uh, didn't necessarily pin their hopes on making a career of high-rise commercial office buildings. But frankly, uh, back at that time when just survival was a, a significant issue, um, the doing of high, the high-rise commercial office building had to be looked at in a, in a more, not necessarily altruistic way, but with the realization that, frankly, these building types basically made up the fabric of the city. And so how could the architectural profession consider a building type that is so ubiquitous to not be important <laughs> as, a, as a participant, as, as an architectural assignment. And so I will give myself the credit of starting to ask myself, how can I find a series of strategies that will enable me to design these buildings in a way that are connected to the city? Mm. Now, 
the first building that really launched us was 333 Waco Drive in Chicago. Um, that building was probably the only building that I've ever experienced an almost immediate reaction uh, to the site. The site was so uh, gestural, the response that was necessary seemed to be so obvious, at least to me, that mm. the building um, identified its place in the skyline simply by the virtue of the tautness of the curve along the Chicago River. Yeah. But that building was followed not by too many others of, 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 of direct sort of descendancy, but it, it was followed by my, um, my infatuation with postmodernism. Hmm. And in my book, you don't see any examples of, of postmodern buildings because I've edited them all out. But I, I decided to pursue postmodernism mainly because it offered the possibilities of buildings connecting to each other. Within the fabric of the traditional city, all buildings essentially form a linkage to each other through the nature of their composition. They're derived essentially from the classical language loosely derived. And most of the buildings meet the ground in, in a way, they meet the sky in a way, they meet their, their boundaries, their windows are framed in a way. They all use elements that are in common. And so as a result, by using elements in common, the entire fabric of the traditional city links together. Well, that's why I explored postmodernism and I did it for about four or five years. Finally, with the realization that you know, it was, if I pursued postmodernism and did buildings that were going to be able to be linked, it was only, it was only going to be effective if the buildings next to me <laughs> wanted to join in the, in the same language. Right. Well, that, that was an unrealistic expectation. That there was no degree of unanimity as to how buildings needed to be, exp uh, needed to be expressed architecturally, particularly the tall building. And so it will take me back, back, took me back to your suggestion of the anthropomorphic aspects of the tall building. Mm -hmm. The tall building and a group of tall buildings tend to stand with each other in ways that either can acknowledge their presence and their conversation one way or the other, or they can completely forget about it and, and do their own thing. Well, the, the, the sad fact of the city is that almost all buildings bear no relationship one to another. They have no interest in trying to, to define anything that they hold in common. But from that time on, I tried to develop a series of strategies that would enable the building to be composed of pieces that started to talk to adjacent pieces that were related to the building. Right. And even compositional strategies for the buildings themselves that enabled their composition to naturally produce elements that had abilities to talk one way on one side of the building and another way on another side of the building. And uh, in many respects, I consider that one of my most productive periods in the tall building. And it was, it was best symbolized by two buildings which are in the book the DC Bank in Frankfurt and the uh, René Levesque IBM headquarters in Montreal. Uh -huh. And those, those two buildings uh, and the manner in which they are composed were, were totally connected to elements within the city which became sort of the, the generators of their form. And uh, that designing a, a building that way uh, was extremely satisfying because it, it, it gave very obvious um, indications of how it was oriented, why it was oriented, and, and how it was communicated. Do, uh, hmm. 
do, how do you feel about um, like I was just down in Boston recently, and and one of the lesser buildings, in in my opinion, is being reskinned, um, uh -huh. renovated, if you will, and it's the first time I've personally seen a, a high rise uh, f floor to ceiling completely uh, reskinned. It will be a completely different time capsule uh, now that it's being reskinned. How do you how do you feel about that happening in in city environments that the it, it, in many ways the the buildings staying as they are good or bad kind of give you a history of place that if we start reskinning all these you know extremely monumental visual things if we start reskinning them all it's like we're erasing our past be it good or bad I I don't know how I feel about that. What are, what's your take on that? Well, I would assume they're being done um, for reasons of sustainability. Yeah. I would oh, ass that's... assume that the, the, the facades that they're replacing were inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, the buildings have to meet metrics that are much more challenging nowadays. Right. And uh, they're probably being done with, with uh, walls that are highly efficient. Whether or not these buildings can uh, can generate any form of communication and conversation is another issue. Right. Uh, working with the, the bones of the original structure uh, doesn't give you much chance to, to be able to, to modify them uh, in response to, right. to, to others. So uh, I would guess that the, the answer is really more of a practical answer than, than anything. Hmm. So uh, let me put you on a little bit of a hot seat and you can pass on this question if you want. <laughs> there, there's a building in Boston, uh, a downtown high rise, you know, skyscraper essentially, uh, that I believe Philip Johnson did. And it's a repetition of Palladian windows the whole way up. It's like okay. a, a pink granite with then white Palladian windows. I, I think, think this would be a representation of postmodernism. I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm not as uh, well versed on that as I should be. But it, to me, the building is just horrible. Now, I may be saying some very bad things and I'll be canceled for it. Who knows? But it, it, it is such an incredible time capsule of 1990. It, just absolutely unmistakable. Maybe given another 20 years, it'll, it'll be received differently in even my mind. I don't know if you're familiar with that building and your take on it at all, or if you'd like to hit the pass button and move on to the next question. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, if a building is good, um, assumedly its virtue will be recognized, uh, you know, uh, through the passing of time. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, I mean, for example, the Hunting and Art Museum in, in, on Columbus Circle uh, was, a, was a, a postmodern pastiche that when it was reskinned and uh, quite successfully reskinned, uh, the, the demolition and the loss of it was exactly, the concern for it was exactly what you're saying. It was a record of the history of the city. And we, we, were, you know, we were erasing an aspect of our history, which, whether we like it or not, uh, was necessarily something that uh, marked the evolution of the place. Mm. So you know, one, can, one, can very, you know, one can very easily be um, persuaded that, that that's a strong argument. Um, that is also an argument that's probably needs to be legislated uh, and uh, buildings, certain buildings need to be considered to be markers for their time. Right. <laughs> and right. Consider the, but uh, uh, not all buildings can be because for the obvious reasons, not all buildings are efficient uh, or can meet the standards of today's necessity. Right. I guess a, um, a term it might be coined already, but maybe a term needs to be coined that 
lets you know because I go around New England or anywhere else in the country and the buildings that are old seem to be good buildings and it makes you think that they must have just been far more uh, uh, well informed on their taste and, and proportions and everything else for everything that was built at the time but the reality might be that there was a lot of horrible buildings, but only the good ones survived because they were good. And we're going through the process now of reskinning some buildings, maybe for efficiency's, efficiency's sake, or maybe they were just poorly done, not designed well, and everyone kind of agrees. We don't need to hold on to that one, but others get put into like the uh, historical record and you can't touch them. You have to actually update them to a, a, a efficiency standard while keeping their look. And I guess maybe that answers the question in my mind that they didn't necessarily have better taste a century ago as much as the stuff that's left over from a century ago was simply the stuff that was done in good taste and everything else was taken out. Well, I, 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 a century ago, uh, buildings were built in a relatively similar way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know the, the steel frame when it was initially introduced in, in Chicago for tall buildings was a, a major breakthrough, which uh, wasn't followed immediately by a, a, a change in the external cladding of the building. The external cladding of the building was pretty much left the same and the steel frame resided within. Right. But the ability to build with masonry, uh, in particular, uh, with a system of composition which, which sort of told you how to connect a building to the earth, sort of told you how to frame a window, it sort of told you how to meet the sky. Mm. Obviously, good people did it, bad people, architects did it, but by and large, the, re the general result was a much higher level. Right. And that's what I refer to as the traditional city. Uh, and, and this is not just within the United States, but of course, around the world, that, that, that the traditional language of construction uh, produced a connection in the fabric of the city that was exceptional. Hmm. And it was only a, when we started tearing it apart uh, with the exceptions to this language that things became challenging. And some very good things were done because some very talented people did them. But without the reliance on a common language of building and a common language of composition, only a very few people could do good buildings. Mm. And that was the problem. A lot of people produce buildings without any basis of a compositional understanding, without any basis of, of well, frankly, without the sufficient talent to be able to do buildings that are breaking away from a compositional norm. Hmm. And having a compositional norm was, was one of my thoughts <laughs> uh, during a period of my life, was that if we could reinstate a compositional norm that is basically connected to the boundaries of the buildings, hmm. and, and, and think of these in, in, in ways that, that made them common elements, uh, we could start to reinstate uh, aspects of what we once considered the city we so loved. Hmm. Well, you know, it, it, that, that's hopeless. And it's, um, every building is essentially a building for itself. It's on its own. And it only depends on the, the, the abilities of the people that execute it. And so that's, that's risky pro proposition. I'm, it's, it's taking all of my mental energy to be able to keep up with you, <laughs> uh, to, to process everything you're saying while the questions are coming up in my mind. You have so much uh, experience that you're able to articulate and for someone to kind of drink from the fire hose like myself, if you will. Um, the, it, it seems like what you're saying that, you know, century or centuries ago, the resulting form of a building was influenced to a very high degree by the limitations of the material. It, it put the final form 
in a much more constrained um, box, if you will. And I mean, to do things like domes on the on the Pantheon or um, I believe in Florence, that one sat without a dome for a long time because they had forgotten the technology to come back mm -hmm. and put it on. And to to come into this tech technological uh, advancement of steel frame structures, all of a sudden we have this building technology that we can create any form we want practically comparative to stone and masonry, which we were kind of limited with before. And so now we've, we're kind of going through the growth, growth pains, if you will, maybe in developing these, the designs of skyscrapers and everything else that uh, we, we have to grow through this learning period maybe of now we have this technology uh, that is not as much informed by the limits of the material and more so by the imagination of the designer. Well, I mean, what, once the steel structure was introduced, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, impetus was to clad it with the lightest possible enclosure because mm -hmm. there was no need for a load-bearing additional structure. The steel did all the work. Right. So to be honest to construction, one would, as Mies van der Rohe did in the, in the 20s, designed highly elegant uh, enclosures, which were extremely lightweight. Mm. And all of that makes a great deal of sense uh, based on our present day construction and should in no way be, be discouraged. But at the same time, uh, buildings that were designed in this way that thought of themselves as being isolated entities were in fact isolated entities. For example, the Seagram building on, on uh, Park Avenue when it was first built, you know, across from the racket club and the, the other masonry structures that surrounded it, it was an entirely different entity because it was an exception mm. amongst the rule. Yeah. And the rule was basically the rule of the traditional city and this gleaming object was placed in it and it looked fantastic. One, because it was an extremely beautiful building. It still is an extremely beautiful building. But when, when all of the, the second rate uh, uh, examples of, of buildings which take it as an inspiration, but don't take it with the same degree of sincerity and, and talent mm. that Mies van der Rohe did, <laughs> yeah. then, you're, then you're in trouble. And that's what we've got. And that com combined with the fact that the geometries of buildings now are becoming more aggressive and, uh, and, and more uh, disrespectful, frankly, to the, uh, the sense of a conversation going on with, with uh, their adjacent neighbors. Mm. Um, so this, this issue of, uh, of what I've been reduced to <laughs> In, in, in this aspect of gesture and, and response. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's the site, it's the place that is making the gesture, not necessarily the building. The building is making the response to the gesture of the place. And every place has an inherent gesture. One's ability to learn how to read that the nature of the place, even if it's fragmented, uh, is, is something that needs to be highly developed in an architect. Mm. And, but wanting to do it and knowing how to do it are two different things. Mm. And in, in many respects, modern architecture has blatantly disregarded the aspect of wanting to do it mm. in favor of the uh, freedom of being able to do, do any damn thing that one wants to do. <laughs> Man, that, it, it's amazing to me the, um, the, the, the mapping of our social um, evolution uh, with mm -hmm. our architectural evolution. It, it is one and the same. And we, we, we do it for the same reasons and we struggle with it for the same reasons and we criticize it for the same reasons, but inevitably it happens. That's yes. a, that's a, that's a really, uh, interesting 
there's there's a commonality of truth underlying both of those in the human condition i think that that uh, make it inevitable per your interest what you're doing that the same struggle uh, the same conflict arises um and to 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 understand what's going on in the two that allows them to map over each other is is something that i can only outline but not understand at this point <laughs> so a useless well, comment I mean, maybe well you know we all dress in a certain way now we all dress very differently than we used to you know <laughs> I'm, I'm interviewing a world famous architect in a wrinkled pink yeah. t-shirt from my local uh convenience store so I don't know what I'm signaling here, but it's probably signaling not in a good way. <laughs> well, no, but it, 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 it's a reality of things, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it, it, all of us are affected by it. I, I came back to, to New York interviewing with I.M. Pei in a beautiful three-piece Italian suit. Well, <laughs> no, one, no one would show up in a three-piece Italian suit, you know, to save their life nowadays, you know, and, and my closet's full of them. Right. So yeah, I, think, I think the nature, the issue is how to be able to understand the, the, the sort of natural exuberance that on one level people are, are creating as individuals and the manner in which they communicate with each other and think of architecture as being like a, it's like a party. It's like a gathering of people. The people are getting together for a social event. And it's how the people act at that social event. I mean, uh, regardless of whether it was the School of Athens by Raphael or, uh, you know, a, a modern gathering, people are there to communicate with each other. And when we dress, we dress in a way which enables us to communicate with the, with the gathering that we're uh, associating ourselves with, right? right. And, right. and uh, the same should be true of buildings. Buildings should find a way of trying to respond through their gestures to the nature of the gathering. Hmm. And, and that's basically what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that I, I, I think buildings can be tremendously dramatic. I think buildings can be uh, you know, uh, unique in their character. But the manner in which they generate that character, the manner in which they talk, needs to be appropriate to the place. I mean, we did a bu building uh, in, in Tokyo, uh, in the financial district in Tokyo, and it's so unlike any b other building that we've done, mainly because the financial district of Tokyo is so unlike any other place we've done. Every mm -hmm. one of our buildings, frankly, it's very unlike any other building we've done. And it's, it's all because it's of this issue of how does a conversation work in a specific place? Do, do you think that was something that your clients immediately recognized that they were uh, hiring a firm that would give them a response to their place rather than a singular vision from a visionary? kind of thing like I am. Well, that, that depends a lot on their aspirations. Yeah. Uh, if the client wants uh, to participate in the process, uh, the, the client is perhaps less concerned about getting something that will stand isolated in space as a monument and more interested in, in, get, in getting something that is, um, well, something they can participate in to begin with and, and something that is responsive. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, well, we find ourselves oftentimes in competitions where the building that is the most singular is the building that wins the competition hmm. very frequently. Okay. Um, I had a follow-up question to that that I forgot, but I'm sure it'll come back to me. Um, but another, another thing, a, a question that only you can answer uh, as far as people that I'm able to talk to, through through this period of COVID that we've, we've gone through, uh, the cities have been in, in large part vacated, especially the super tall buildings because they're just gathering places for you know tons and tons of people. But in that process, it seems like we've realized that the environment uh, required previous to the technology to connect with people like this 
required these type of buildings for massive amounts of people to come to to be able to interact is there a potential of the super tall building becoming kind of like the dinosaur in that it's it's a it will be a marker of a time gone by eventually because technology will take us eventually to a place where we can meet in person almost on the same level of being in person and not need though the high expense and cost and everything else of having a technology like a super tall building to accommodate all of us coming together but more so working independently from remote locations, but the technology allows us to be together as one seamlessly. It, do they suffer that well, fate potentially? Well, yeah, that's really an interesting question. And uh, our office is, is you know, dealing with it like every other entity is dealing with it right now because we have 400 people or so in our New York office that have been working with extreme efficiency over the last year. Hmm. Um, we have frankly had the best year of our, our career. Wow. As a commercial we, firm. As where, a commercial firm, yeah. we've had the best year of our, our firm. And there, there's a great deal of enthusiasm for working from home. Now, and, and I, I, I'm, I don't know which side of this equation to come down on. I do know that the culture of, of an organization um, is, mm. is built over a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, it is built through human interaction. Uh, and the degree to which people are able to interact um, and the messages that are <laughs> transmitted during that interaction generate the culture of a firm. Mm. We've been working on Zoom for 18 months now, or somewhere around there. Um, in one respect, it's, it's too early to, to, to say. But um, in our own firm, we have nine offices. We hold every Friday a town hall. That town hall is led by Jamie Von Klemper and Nick Dunn. And never in our history have all of the offices had a better understanding of each other. Wow. Well, yeah. because every, every week there's a new topic. Every week there are new people that are presenting that you've never seen before in your life. Uh, these are young people that are presenting that would never have presented 10 years ago. Now, is this just old... since COVID that you've been doing this town hall every just, week? Just since COVID. Okay. And okay. It's, it's done religiously. Mm. And it, it has been a fantastic, I mean, I, I'm essentially retired and it's, it's enabled me to keep uh, up and connected to the firm, you know? So um, I think it's gonna take a while for this to play out. I mean, the, the solution that people seem to be coming up with is that people will come into the office a few days a week or a couple of days a week and then stay home for three. And that seems to be the preferred uh, uh, direction in our office. I personally, in a working on a design team or with a design team, find it very difficult not to be able to sit there with my pencil and draw something with somebody. Sure. Uh, sure. But it, it, that's not to say that it can't be done. <laughs> it's just because I'm, I'm too old to do it that way. <laughs> uh, so I, honestly, I can't give you an answer to the question. Huh. It, well, it, 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 things are going to change, but one has to realize that. You know, the most efficient way to, in an era of sustainability, to house people is compactly. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, re the re reduction of redundancy is, is uh, clearly a, a major component of that. I don't know how that fully plays into it, but if one keeps a, a residential environment and an office environment, maybe that's a redundancy in itself. Maybe one should be eliminated. I don't know. <laughs> Now, what what was the difficult? Uh, what were the very difficult to process and decide on points in leaving an office like I am pays? Because if I were to put myself in your position and be 
working with someone like IM Pay, I would be tempted to think, this is it. It will never get better than this. Do not leave the shadow of this, you know, visionary. Um, but you had the, you know, uh, at, at the time you could maybe call it audacity and and lack of intelligence to leave that. But that's not what it was. You accomplished amazing things. What got you over that that um, it would be a fear, a fear of leaving something like working with IM Pay. What what brought you through that decision, knowing that that was the best thing to do? Well, uh, uh, what brought us through was was um, or brought me through it was um, essentially the, the the inspiration for the firm that I ended up founding. Mm -hmm. um, I realized. I thought I was the best designer at I.M. Pei's office. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I realized that becoming, working oneself into an independent position where one could do buildings on one's own mm -hmm. was really not part of the equation. And in, the, in his office. In his office, the structure yep. was set up basically to serve three partners. Mm -hmm. And it was set up to serve three partners in perpetuity. And uh, I was really not interested. And I don't think anybody can generate the same enthusiasm for serving a partner after you've done it a number of times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you want to be able to find. So that was, that was the impetus. But it was also the impetus of the nature of the way we constructed our office such that we were not going to do that. Once a person was, got to a point where they were able to take on things by themselves, uh, then they were offered the opportunity to do it. Now, this has a downside because <laughs> what, it's, it's easy to do it one, with one person, two people, three people, and expand it out to six people and eight people. It's another thing when you've got 400 people and you know, 100 of them are really good and need opportunities. <laughs> there are a limited number of opportunities. So, uh, our office is, is, is facing an, another dynamic in, in, in its growth. Hmm. How, so how do, you, how do you manage that without it becoming a, a cutthroat competitive environment, but, but a, an interactive, co-op, cooperative competitive environment to get to the well, place to be able to do that? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a, a really the essence of it. The individuals that can't work in, in a cooperative yet competitive way uh, are, are not not encouraged or let go mm. and, and people a lot of people just can't work that way people want to do it their way you know yeah. well that's fine but it's not fine for our office and so we've had a number of people people actually that have become partners that we've let go uh, because uh, they, they won't perpetuate the culture of the office and the, the culture of the office, the, the higher you get in the office, the greater responsibility you, you have to enable people below you to find opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the, one of the definitions of, of the responsibility of leadership. So um, it, 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 that part is sort of naturally taken care of itself. There is a dimensional aspect to it that, yeah, we, for the last 10 years, we haven't gone through a recession. We went through a, a big recession at the end of the 80s, where uh, the uh, success of our firm, the survival of our firm, was either, e even in question. Uh, that, that sort of culling practice, that sort of experience has, has really not happened for quite mm -hmm. some time, for at least the last 10 years. What's your, what's your sense of impending doom? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not closely enough connected with it. <laughs> I mean, one doesn't what, know what to believe nowadays when, 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 when one uh, <laughs> reads the New York Times or reads, right. <laughs> reads says anything. It, uh, it, it's a challenging time. Yeah. Um, but uh, another question I have that I've, I've tried to pose to a, different, uh, a few different architects from, from an elevated position uh, from different cultures, uh, trying to get an idea of our culture through asking this question to an individual that's built 
in different cultures. You you said in your book uh, that there's a different character to a building between it being in North America, Europe, or Asia. Can you describe to me the, the differences of a character of a building that is a uh, um, something that is, an, uh, how would I say it, like an outpouring of that culture? That culture speaks to you to say the, the character of this building needs to be this because it's in Asia or because it's in North America or because it's in Europe. How do you, how do you define that? Well, uh, the, the best evidence of it is, is looking through the book and, and seeing each building and how, it's, how it uh, does respond uh, because the statement I make is, is a very generalized one and yet even within a specific context uh, there are a lot of specific situations, which all of which would be dealt with differently. But the most dramatic building we perhaps have built uh, is the World Financial, Shanghai World Financial Center. Hmm. Uh, it was at one time scheduled to be the world's tallest building. Uh, that was eclipsed a long time ago. But nevertheless, the aspirations for it to be an exceptionally tall building uh, placed on me a responsibility to find a way of, of generating its form that was connected to Chinese culture. Hmm. Now, <laughs> that's a fairly uh, weighty subject. Uh, there was a building built directly adjacent to us by uh, an architect during the postmodern building and it gave to the building a, a fairly overt pagoda quality. Uh, that's one way of doing it, uh, but I tried to do it in a different way. Uh, a tall building essentially is a connection between earth and sky. Um, as a building roots itself into the earth, it has one responsibility as it meets the sky, it has another. Now. The Japanese, and in their tombs, uh, there were uh, artifacts that were buried in the tombs that represented symbolism for earth and symbolism for sky. The earth symbol was a dark square prism. They were about 12 inches high, 14 inches high, with horizontal striations in it but essentially a pure prism. The earth symbol was a circular disk. The, the sky a, symbol or the earth symbol? The, the, sky, sorry, the sky symbol. The sky okay. symbol was a, a circular disk with a hole in it, in the center of it, and was smooth and, a, and of a very light, almost white stone. So these two elements were put into juxtaposition. We tried to do the same thing for the building itself. Mm. to create a building that met the sky. Um, initially, it met the sky as a moon gate, right? Uh, a big circular aperture carved into the top of the building, which was necessary for the reduction of wind forces on the top of the building. The base of the building met the, build met the earth as a pure square prism, and it was clad in stone. And the translation between the two involved the two programs, the office building and the hotel superimposed upon it, both of which had separate ideal geometries. And so the, the geometry of the ultimate building was a fusion between the geometry that was ideal for the office building and the geometry which was ideal for the hotel building. And it created a structure which was based on the intersection of two enormous celestial arcs that I drew, had drawn, which enabled the carving of the pure square prism by these curved celestial arcs, and that created the form of the building. Now, this symbolism, uh, this symbolism is interesting to listen to, but if it didn't look good, it isn't worth a damn, you know? Right, it but just it's, happened to... it's pulled from, from culture and from truths that they have perceived through their culture and struggle and everything else that they've come to this summation of, of 
kind of these uh, icons of earth and sky that that you directly pull from. And I'm imagining you had a lot of that in a presentation of form to your client that they probably ate up. Well, I, I did, and they it, it, it turned out to be the, the most beautiful form yeah. of any I've ever done. Um, but in my, our client was Japanese, Mr. Mori from uh, Tokyo, and our, uh, the city it was being built in was Shanghai in China. Mm. So I presented it to uh, seven Chinese authorities at, at a major presentation. And I expected a very positive response because everybody had made a positive response. And I had the first woman that got up said, and she was very motherly and gave a sense of great warmth. She said, perhaps this building is acceptable, but it certainly isn't desirable. Hmm. Well, I couldn't figure out what, and it went from her, from her position, and it got worse as, it, as we went. They wow. were listening to my 10-minute ten, ten presentation, and, and they had 45 minutes each to respond to my 10-minute presentation. Wow. Well, as it turned out, I had cut this, what I considered to be a moon gate through the top of the building. And a month later, we read in a Hong Kong paper that a Japanese developer has walked into Shanghai with a flag held high. They saw the circular opening not as a Chinese moon gate, but it's a Japanese flag. Right, right. And so this created a huge amount of controversy. Hmm. And it included a meeting with me and the mayor of Shanghai and Mr. Mori, and a whole resolution of putting a bridge across the circle to symbolize the joining between two sides. But ultimately, the resistance became too strong, and we had to change it from a circle to a trapezoid, which is what ended up finally existing. So, you know, buildings, Particularly in, in, in Asian cultures, buildings create symbols that are extremely powerful and are read through very commonplace associations. For example, the, the bird's nest in, in the Olympic Games. Mm. Uh, you know, who would have thought of calling that a bird's nest? But I, I think, you know, uh, the Oriental eye perhaps is, is more symbolically connected to, well, to shape and form, maybe through their calligraphy. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I would, I would certainly think so. They're, they're essentially pictographs, from my understanding. They're pictographs, yes. And yeah. so buildings themselves take on a, a, an enormous symbolism. So, but at any rate, that, you know, the attempt was to try to, to make a building connected to Chinese culture. I think we succeeded in doing it. And uh, every specific place you build has a different set of, of, of forces to respond to. Now, the, the, um, I traveled to Japan, Hong Kong, and the Philippines with my parents when I was uh, early in my teen years. And I remember just the striking um, culture contrast from what I was used to. I had never been in, in Asia or anything else. And it, it was just astounding to me. But to travel to Europe, it feels... Uh, it feels like to me, it feels similar, but but you know different in its culture because it has such a similar background of of religiosity and everything else. Where the things that I'm used to seeing personally are are similar. What are what are the striking differences in your experience of creating buildings for the two separated but very similar cultures of Europe and North America? Oh, that becomes the, between Europe and North America, my, my, my greatest, uh, I, I've done buildings in London. And um, Oh, your building in London, I was, I forget the name of it, but I have to say the financial district of London just blows me away. And then the, to see your building there, just amazing. Love it. The scum. Well, you know, that, that, that's an interesting example because the city planners had decided to cluster tall buildings together. And they decided that each building was to take on a unique personality. Mm. And it started with Lord Foster's gherkin, 
which was a very you know, interesting shape. And then uh, 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 Richard Rogers did the Cheese Grater, which is also a very handsome building. And he done Lloyd's of London, which is a very interesting building. So here was a, I, I made an analogy between this site situation as it was almost like going to a costume party. I mean, each one of the participants was so outrageous and so mm. specific that <coughs> we had to respond with a building that was Un, untraditionally contextual for us. And we did. The building ended up being called the Scalpel, which I, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it seemed to have uh, uh, at least uh, uh, formed the, the, it created the, the uh, ability to, to join this costume party in a, in a way that was effective. Well, yeah, you have the walkie talkie and the shard and scalpel and. <laughs> That right, is interesting. Right. My wife and I spent our, uh, I'll get myself in trouble here, but I believe it was our 16th or 17th year anniversary in London. And I just love staying in a city, staying at a hotel and just walking and wandering every day. And the yeah. wandering through the financial district of London for me with my background in architecture and interest in what I do is, is just absolutely, uh, I want to go back again, even though it was only like two or three years ago. It's just amazing. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. Uh, your accomplishments and work that you've done have been amazing. I, I really appreciate uh, receiving this book in the mail and being able to have it on my coffee table and pick it up and go through it. I'd recommend anyone listening who has uh, any interest in becoming a firm that does this type of work or who just appreciates good photography, whatever. Uh, it's it's amazing. There's so much here to, to process. So thank you for writing this book. Thank you for taking the time to uh, speak with us. And uh, thanks again. <laughs> well, Trent, thank you. Your, your questions were just terrific. I, I, I haven't enjoyed an interview more. <laughs> <laughs>